Nat, did you want to say anything to kick us off? Or are you happy just to jump straight into questions? Let's just go straight to questions. Go straight forward. Andrew? Could you briefly describe the role of the judiciary in the UK's current constitutional arrangements? Well, the, the, the current role of the, 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 the judiciary in, in, in judicial review is essentially ensuring that central and local government and public bodies act within the powers conferred on them by Parliament. Um, but that is filtered through the judge's idea of the rule of law, rather as the previous witness was describing. Um, and the, the, the best short formulation of what it seems to me the judiciary in general thinks about this is, is in Lord Bingham's book on the rule of law, where he says that an administer, and this is how the rule of law applies to, the, to this particular context, ministers and public officers at all levels must exercise the powers conferred on them in good faith, fairly, for the purpose of which the powers were conferred without exceeding the limits of such powers and not unreasonably. So that's a sort of general statement of what one imagines the is going through the judiciary's mind when they're making decisions in these cases. Um, who, if you like, owns the rule of law? Is there some higher principle of the rule of law which in certain circumstances might trump parliamentary sovereignty? And the difficulty there is that the judges and, and um, parliament or the government might have different views about um, what the rule of law meant in certain particular circumstances. So I suppose, um, going back to our, our recent e event, Chairman, I mean, the, the, the practical question here um, is if Parliament were to introduce primary legislation which the judges believed to be contrary to the rule of law, as they understood it, um, <coughs> what would they actually do about it, and that is the particular difficulty we might be confronting at the moment with the current government consultation exercise. Okay, thank you. Um, we've discussed already this morning, <coughs> and you, uh, in reply to Mr. Turner, um, mentioned judicial review and some of the processes in the UK, but I wonder how judicial review here differs uh, from countries where there is actually a codified constitution. Well, the, the, the key distinction, I mean, I, I'm, you know, the, 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 as I understand it, um, the great majority, probably all countries which are essentially democratic rule of law jurisdictions, um, have some form of judicial review whereby appellants can go to the court and say, um, this official has acted beyond powers, his appropriate powers, or he's behaved unfairly. Now, how likely um, those applications are to succeed is another matter. I think I'm right in saying that in, in, in Singapore, in the whole history of the Republic, there has been no successful application for judicial review, despite the fact that that process it, it, it exists in principle. Um, so that, that form of judicial review against the actions of officials is quite general. Um, the other part, the other sort of judicial review, which is judicial review of legislation, can only happen if there is some higher benchmark against which to judge its legitimacy. And that higher benchmark normally in most states is indeed a codified constitution. As I said earlier, it doesn't need to be. Go going on from that, um, the idea that judges might get involved in assessing the validity of primary legislation against some constitution, I think is a separate issue to that of codification. The, the, the best example of, of, of that is in Israel. Israel has no um, codified constitution, but a practice has developed whereby the legislature labels or certifies some laws as being constitutional and should there be a conflict the Israeli courts will then give privacy to those 
constitutional or so-called basic laws over other laws. So that's an example on the one hand. On the other hand, we have the Dutch constitution, which although it is codified in, in the conventional sense, um, all the rules laid out, um, specifically forbids the judiciary from pining on the validity of primary legislation. So these two issues, although often wrapped into one, I think are in principle separate. Um, could, could we take up the, uh, a point made by our previous witness in saying that uh, he didn't think we'd achieve a codified constitution, but it's beneficial, certainly educational to MPs, um, to discuss this and to, uh, and to consider the, uh, the consequence of it. Well, I mean, what's your view? Are, are well, we going to get there? I, I think when, if, you, if you look at international comparisons, when countries come up with brand new constitutions, mm -hmm. it's in the context of some sort of general political crisis which requires a reformation of the state, in other words a change from one regime to another or the granting of independence or the settlement of a civil war or something of, of that nature. South Africa is a good example. So I, I, I'd sort of rephrase the question and say, well, how likely is it that something like that's going to happen in the UK and in the foreseeable future? Probably rather unlikely, although Scottish independence, if it happened, might just be such an event, so it's not to be completely ruled out. Um, in the absence of that, is anything in the codification direction um, very likely to happen? Um, I think it's, there is some merit in assembling the obvious constitutional legislation and labelling it, putting a big constitution label on the cover, as it were. How far that really takes us, I'm not sure. Um, the change that I'd like to see, um, and I've argued this before this committee before, is a much simpler one, where Parliament itself um, simply starts labelling when appropriate, new laws as being constitutional. Lord Lester last week uh, resisted the idea that uh, uh, parliaments here of all parties have become more willing to release power to, uh, through the devolution process uh, to Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and to Europe as well. And, but he gave an example of that, that presumably that, that's not going on, that uh, uh, Parliament is as power retentive as ever. Uh, he used the example uh, of the um, prisoners' rights, um, I'm afraid, the two prisoners' rights to vote. Um, do you find that the, the process is going on and it is a slippery slope and it will continue and that power will be devolved uh, a, in, uh, in a, in, in the, in, uh, from Parliament in the way that it has been over the last 20 years? Well, I, I think it's, it, it, it's a complex question because several different things seem to me to be happening at, at, at once. One, one thing, is, as you say, is that it's, it's in line with Britain's relative decline in the world and the process of accession to the EU that Parliament has sacrificed in practice, if not in theory, an area of authority um, to other jurisdictions. It's also sacrificed authority within the UK to other jurisdictions through the process of devolution. Um, in the core area, um, over which Parliament still appears to have a, an untravelled authority, there are further difficulties, again re re referred to in previous evidence, trying to pin down what the extent of that sovereignty really is when the courts are becoming perhaps more assertive in talking about principles rather than simply the interpretation of legislation. And I think that in turn reflects a, a general decay in relations between the law and parliament which has been going on for some time. Um, and some of that is just the, the general siloing of elites which seems to have occurred over the last 50 years or more. I mean, at one time, it's a mythical golden age. There were quite a lot of MPs who um, 
were que- worked as QCs in the morning and then came to Parliament in, in the mm. afternoon. <laughs> and if those people ever existed, there aren't very really many of them anymore. Um, I think a significant um, event in, in, in that process of breakdown of relationships was the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, which on paper looked quite sensible because it removed this rather anomalous position of, of, of the Lord Chancellor and seemed to be what was a, a, a move towards the kind of set, formal separation of powers which would be normal in, in, in most um, countries. But the actual effect of it was um, further breakdown in communication, I believe, because it was a rather odd position that the Lord Chancellor had. It was an important link between the legislature and the judiciary and, and, and a, um, a safety valve, if you like, when things went wrong. And now the Lord Chancellor is, dare I say, just another minister who, who isn't even a lawyer at the moment. At the same time, um, the senior judiciary, while they're still on the bench, no longer sit in the Lords, although they come back afterwards. So at one time, and this is caricaturing it slightly, this country was run by an establishment of people who might have gone to the same schools and had similar ideas about how things ought to work. And a lot of that was never really written down in any formal way. And those understandings, for, for good or ill, are, are breaking down. Thank you, Nat. Is there anything that you would like to say? Anything left unsaid? This is your moment. Um, I think just to risk of advertising our own activities, um, go back to the, 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 the seminar that you, you weren't able to attend, Chairman. Um, Something that's going on at the moment which is highly relevant to this is the government consultation exercise on the scope of judicial review. And um, some of that is about administrative tidying up and efficiency and is uncontroversial. Um, But some of it is not. And two proposals particularly are, I think, worrying in their implications. Um, One is on the question of standing. Um, At the moment, even an unaffected party um, may apply for judicial review if there is a public interest involved. And the people who make these applications are typically NGOs. And the suggestion in the consultation exercise is that that should be stopped. In other words, someone has to have a direct interest where they have been personally affected before they may apply. At the same time, there's another proposal in the consultation exercise whereby protective cost orders, and these are the orders that um, immunise the applicant from picking up the defence costs, the government costs, if he loses, should only be available if people do not have a direct interest. And you can see how the combined effect of those two measures would very severely reduce um, the set of people who are ever capable of applying for judicial review. They would have to be wealthy people with a direct interest. Um, What is the reaction of the judiciary going to be if these measures are introduced? Well, um, it's far from certain that they will go along with it. They may take the view that in this particular instance there is a higher principle of rule of law which um, they will use as a way of, in effect, not accepting this. And we have other examples of that in the past where <coughs> ouster clauses in legislation, in other words, a, a, a clause in a, in, a, in a statute which says the courts may not review the validity of this act or the legality of this action have been politely ignored by the judges. But this comes back to the question, not what is the truth of it, because the truth of it is what people believe. What do judges believe that they are guardians of some thing called the rule of law, which sits separate to the authority of Parliament? And I personally believe it's a proposition that's best not tested. And if these government proposals go ahead, it is going to be tested. Now, that's very thought-provoking. I shall think about what you said.
and at the very least I think we will clip that piece of your evidence and make sure that our colleagues on the Justice Select Committee who may well be looking at this matter, I'm sure they are, have that in front of them. Uh, it's a matter for them if they wish to call you of course, but I will bring that to the attention of my fellow Chair of that Select Committee.